This podcast contains adult language and stories of true crime. If you don't like laughing, crying, or being horrified at the actions of other humans, this podcast is not for you. Hello, and welcome to Season 4, Episode 11, Part 2 of Resolved Mysteries. This is the show where we rewatch, recap, and give you the latest updates to the cases featured on the show, Unsolved Mysteries. I'm Allison. I'm Eliza. I'm Carlin. And welcome to the show. As most of you know, for every review that we receive, we donate a dollar to a different organization, and that this month's organization is the Coalition of Omakal of Imokali workers, suggested by our patron, Matthew. So thanks, Matthew. If you'd like to recommend a nonprofit for us to support and support us on Patreon, you'll get access to ad-free episodes, two additional episodes a month, early access to listener short stacks, along with goodies in the mail. Go to patreon.com slash Resolved Mysteries podcast. What are we covering in this episode, ladies? Well, I have a special alert segment about a church arsonist. What does that mean exactly? Special alert. Are you going to tell us later? I don't remember why it's different. Is it like very timely? Yeah, we had a special alert. Yeah, a kidnapping, right? Yeah, a kid Mm. that, I think it was Nyleen K. Marshall, maybe? Usually it's very timely. The FBI, they usually have like, the special alert we saw before was the guy was there with Stack, like an yeah. FBI agent. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't necessarily know why this one has to be a special alert. It's just also a wanted segment. Okay. So, yeah. Hmm. Sorry, I was just curious about that from before. Yeah. Um, and then we've got a treasure, baby. Yay! It's the Trabuco treasure. Give me that gold, baby. Give me mm-hmm. that gold. Mm-hmm. All right. Ready? I'm ready. Let's do it. I am also ready. Oh, let's Great. do it. Let's do a podcast. All right. So Carlin asked the very wonderful question, why is it a special alert? I'm just doing a quick Google, Googleable here. Special alert, unsolved mysteries. Just a second. Because <laughs> I think there is something... Well, yeah, like with the other one, it was kind of like this happened very recently. So we're letting you know. Yeah. The little girl had just gone missing. Mm -hmm. It's just like some of them could also be classified special alerts, too, I feel like. And they're not. Yeah. I don't know. True. Like sometimes it's just happened. I don't know. Okay. So this is the case of a church arsonist in Florida. So Stack tells us that police are searching for the person responsible for more than 26 church arson fires throughout Florida. Crazy. That's a lot. lot. It is a lot. Uh, We see a very high-tech graphic of good old Florida with a little fire, basically the fire emoji all over it, (laughs) Mm -hmm. which we'll post. Like what Oregon's Um, map looked like last summer. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so these fires started in July of 1990 in Jackson County, and by February 1991, 11 churches had been hit. By June, the total was up to 15. Um, Then they stopped until October 24th of 1991 when the arsonist attacked the First Baptist Church in Ocala. And then literally in seven days... Seven more churches were burned. That is terrible and terrifying if you're a parishioner or if you're the person in charge of the church. Yes. There must have Um, been people sitting up all night. Yes. Mm -hmm. So damage estimates were around eight to ten million dollars. Wow. It's so much money. And yeah, I mean, I am not a churchgoer, but I think. For a lot of people, these places are their community, Mm -hmm. and hopefully churches are doing what they should be doing and helping others. And we do see a talking head, Pastor R.L. Renfro, who's part of the Gainesville Ministerial Association, and he says... 
Quote, churches like ours like to stay open and offer people a place to meditate or pray and be involved 24 hours a day. But it's gotten to a point where we can't leave our doors open. We're having to guard the church. And like you were saying, Allison, I read later that in some churches in the area, people were sleeping on the pews to protect their church at night. Gosh, which is also very dangerous. Dangerous. It's very dangerous because when you see the rubble um, and the aftermath of the fires, they it literally looks like ground zero of 9-11. Like, I could not believe the footage. It was, some of them were so burned, everything wow. completely gone all the way to the ground. Mm. Wow. Um, so really sad. bad. Yeah, so it is dangerous for sure. So Stack says that fortunately, which this is, amazing no one had been killed or injured in any of the fires wow so after the fires in october 1991 a police task force was set up comprised of federal state and local investigators in november 1991 the westwood hills church of god in gainesville was set on fire fortunately no one has been killed or seriously injured during the fires and the arsonist remains at large so I have a list of most of the fires. They um, didn't talk about all of them. They like would p- pick out specific ones to mention, maybe because they are well-known in that area. Okay. But the ones, so I'll tell you about who did it, but the ones in Florida were January 21st. This is all 1991 for the Florida ones. Holy Trinity Episcopal in Gainesville, January 21st, same night, North Central Baptist in Gainesville. Wow. October 18th, First Presbyterian Lake City. Two days later, October 20th, Fellowship Baptist Church in High Springs. Two days later, October 22nd, Gainesville United Church of Christ in Gainesville. Two days later, October 21st, First First Baptist Church in Ocala and First Presbyterian in Ocala. Same night. Next night, First Lutheran Church in Gainesville. November 2nd, Cypress Cathedral. November 2nd, First Church of Christ Scientists. Those are both in Winter Haven. Wow. Two more on November 7th, First Church of Christ Scientists in St. Augustine and McDowell Baptist in St. Augustine. Next night, First Baptist Church, Jacksonville Beach. Holy then shit. November 11th, three nights later, Westwood Hills Church of God, which I mentioned in Gainesville. And then the next night, St. Augustine Catholic Church in Gainesville. Ugh. Wow. When they hit, it's really close together, and yeah. that is so scary. It has to be more than one person. It can't just be one person, right? Running <sighs> around, getting... Uh, yeah, all literally all over Florida when yeah. you look at the map. So, we get a little update, not a lot of information, um, but what UM tells us is that the one person, one arsonist named Patrick Lee Frank, who was a drifter from Tennessee, was responsible for all of the arsons after he was arrested for loitering. And I think after he was arrested for loitering, Literally November 13th, so the day after Mm -hmm. that last fire, he's arrested for loitering, and I think he seemed real weird, and they start questioning him, and he confesses to setting the fires. Wow. I mean, I just wonder how they got there. Well, this man is very unwell. Okay. And he targeted churches people believe um, because he had been sexually abused by a church member as a child. Oh, Oh, no. no. But then he also claimed to hear demons um, in his head. As then they look into his records, in the late 70s, he told doctors that Cuban spies followed him constantly. And mm-hmm. then in 1987, he was telling a social worker that voices were instruct- instructing him to bite off his fingers and to kill himself. Oh, goodness. Oh, no. So is he, like, schizophrenic? 
Yeah, so he How had been... How is he able to move through these towns Well, like that's that, what though? I was going to say. Like, we can always assume somebody who does this kind of thing is unwell, but that type of unwell, it's hard to go undetected. Yeah. Yeah. It's weird. For that long and do that for many that crimes. Long. So many. Because the churches knew that this was happening. They must have right. been on high alert. And if he's acting that bizarre, mm-hmm. how are they not seeing him it's if wild. they're on high alert? It's wild. Oh my goodness. So once he confesses, then of course the number is like 50 churches, which they're saying is in Tennessee and Florida. He's only charged with 15 of them, but there's as many as 50, officials say. Oh, my God. So, oh, sorry. One one article, this case is not, like, very well covered, um, but one of the articles said he's charged with setting 16 church fires in Florida and four in Tennessee. But, again, that's not all of them that happened around that area. Right. So... In 1995, I found a Tampa Bay Times article. And so before 1995, he had been um, found not guilty by reason of insanity Mm -hmm. in like 1993 or something. Okay, I mean, that makes sense. Yeah. So then this 1995 article says, a man who burned as many as 17 churches in Florida will be moved from a Missouri prison. I don't know why he was in Missouri. Weird. To a less secure residential facility in Louisiana. So he's found not guilty by reason of insanity, but I think, he, so then I think he was in, maybe he's in Missouri because the pris- that prison was specifically for oh, inmates okay. like that, but it's not quite a mental hospital. It's not quite a facility. Sure. I don't okay. know. Okay. The article says, a compliant attitude and improvements in his medical condition have earned Patrick Lee Frank a new home. Frank, who's 46 and 95, continues to suffer from the incurable mental disorder that drove him to burn the churches in Florida. Hmm. The Tennessee drifter was found innocent by reason of insanity and sent to a federal prison hospital in Springfield, Missouri. Okay. But then he's there for two years. That's crazy. Paul asked questions of psychologist William R. Carter and Melissa Stoll, a social worker who's helped place Frank at St. Martin de Porres. Paul is the judge, um, so the judge asked questions of the psychologist and the social worker. Security at the facility, management of Frank's medication, his access to incendiary materials, and his medical progress were the main topics. Frank appeared at times to fall asleep during the proceedings. Oh no, he's so medicated. Yeah, so he appeared to fall asleep. A paranoid schizophrenic, he will probably be under some type of controlled supervision for the rest of his life. Mm -hmm. Mm. He uh, suffered from hallucinations and also abused drugs like LSD, cocaine, and marijuana. He tried to hang himself. I read that um, it's really horrible. He tied um, the sheet around his neck and then was tied it to the top railing and was going to jump off. Oh, my God. But inmates stopped him. Mm. Oh, Um, it's terrible. So, but because Frank had been complying with taking his medication and going to counseling, he was able to be moved to this other facility. So, then I cannot find anything else except that fandom says that he was institutionalized for 15 years and released in 2008. So this person is out. In 1991, he was 41, so he would be 71 today. Could still be alive, but I could not find him at all. Yeah, and generally, paranoid schizophrenics don't lead long lives, usually because of drug abuse and then also because the medication that they have to take Mm. takes a toll on them physically Mm. in terms of like musculature stuff and so i i think it's It's just like i couldn't yeah could not find anything i do hope he was able to get better oh but it is just me too i mean i would imagine he had to have made a lot of improvement to Mm -hmm. be released Right, fully released, yeah. It's so sad that, like, imagine all of this stuff is happening in your brain, all of this noise, you're hearing all these voices, 
And then you get medicated and you sort of like wake up and then you realize that you're in prison for the rest of your life because because of the actions you took when you essentially were somebody else. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Horrible. The tragedy is like, okay, well, now you're medicated and you're not quote unquote mentally ill anymore, but you still have to stay in prison forever. Mm, Yeah. (laughs) Or for the next 30 years or 40 years. It's really sad. I think about that all the time when... People are, um, I mean, 2% of people who claim reason of insanity, only 2% are ever like given that. So, oh, wow. Yeah. So 98% of people that say they're not guilty by reason of insanity end up in prison mm-hmm. without any sort of mental health right. assistance. Mm-hmm. Only 2% end up in a mental health facility is what I'm trying wow. to say. Wow. So wow. for him to be able to get that, and then and I then think about those out. people all the time because then they're medicated and with something like schizophrenia now the medication is so good it could be just a matter of months or weeks before your your brain is regulated and you're back to being a quote-unquote normal person and then you face the reality of all of the things that you did when you were unwell and now Mm -hmm. you have a prison sentence to serve Mm -hmm. you know well i guess he's lucky to get out and i hope that he had good medication management and a team helping him. Yeah. But, oh wow. Yeah. And I'm just so glad no one got hurt in these yeah. fires, too. Yeah. I also can't, I can't imagine one person doing yeah. all of that destruction also mentally ill. Like, yeah. It's kind of crazy. He just drove around Tennessee and Florida setting multiple fires every uh, night? I assume. I, I don't even know if he drove. Because he's considered a drifter. Like, he he might have been taking buses. Yeah. I don't know. Wow. Two fires in one night? That's why I said, oh, it had to have been more than one person. I thought you right. were going to say, oh, and he had an accomplice. Or, oh, there was no. also another person simultaneously setting fires. Nope. Wow. Oh gosh. I know. And if you think about, I'm sure to do those all those arsons you're using an accelerant so he's buying stuff right. places yeah. everywhere too that's what i was thinking in an too. area where people know churches are being set on fire right yes you'd think so that- a mentally ill man who is probably talking to himself or engaging in some sort right. of strange outward behavior is buying gasoline <laughs> or kerosene and there are a string of arsons and no one is like hey <laughs> I know. Maybe it's it this guy. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So that's the story of the church arsonist special alert. Wow. Good job. During quarantine, my family and I had to come up with indoor activities to keep us sane. One of the solutions to the endless hours indoors was working on puzzles together. We probably did about one a week, which meant I was always on the hunt for a good puzzle. That's when I found Uni Dragon. Uni Dragon wooden puzzles are gorgeously crafted and simply beautiful. Each puzzle piece has its own unique shape, and we're not talking traditional puzzle shapes here. They are so cool. The puzzles also have an incredibly colorful design. They are so gorgeous. Uni Dragon puzzles make the perfect gift for your partner, kids, friends, and even harder to buy for people like coworkers and extended family. Each puzzle is packed in a premium wooden gift box, and they have a new design released every month, so there are loads of options to choose from. These puzzles are not your average puzzles. They definitely have a wow factor to them, and they're basically little works of art. It is so hard to choose one, but I went with the fox because my daughter loves foxes and she absolutely loved it. These puzzles are so special. They make an incredible gift, which is why it's so awesome that Uni Dragon is giving 10% off to Resolve Mysteries listeners. So start checking off your holiday gift list and head over to unidragon.com and use the promo code SOLVED to get 10% off of your purchase. That's unidragon.com com promo code solved for 10% off of your purchase. Hi there. I'm Regina King, your Eva Queen, and that is my lovely partner. Hi, I'm Lynn Roskamp, your docent of darkness. And we're the host of Disturbing Interest because, well, we have disturbing interest. Lynn, how many times have you killed a conversation and received a look with a fun fact that had to do with murder, mystery, or People sticking mummy dust into their mouths while painting. Is that why I've not been invited back to so many dinner parties? Could be. It's fine. If they can't handle me at my mummiest, then they don't deserve me at my yetiest. And they're just missing out. However, if you're out there thinking, mummies? Mystery? Murder? Yeti? This sounds like my jam. 
then you should give us a listen. That's right. Disturbing Interest is the Terrible Mysteries, Disturbing Histories podcast that you never knew you needed in your life. And you can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, CastBox, Stitcher, with a tin can and a piece of twine, or on pretty much any podcasting platform. Heck, dial us up on a Ouija board. We're not for the faint of heart, and I have a strong love for practicing the Sailor's Dictionary, starting with the letter F. But we always try to leave you with something new on popular stories and bring to light things you've never heard of before. And you might even learn a thing or two. Because with us, you might be disturbed. But you're not alone. What are we even talking about when we talk about true crime? I'm Rebecca Sebastian, host of the weekly interview format podcast, Dialogue, a true crime conversation. Join me every Wednesday for a new conversation about justice. We live in a post-truth society where justice is elusive. Mystery. All of a sudden he was startled awake and he couldn't remember having heard the sound, but he remembered the feeling of having heard a sound. Crime. It's the number one thing victims of crime say afterward is, I knew not to get in the elevator with that guy, open the door to my apartment, walk across that dark street. Cults. Ask to be branded, ask to be held down and say, Master, you know, please brand me. It would be an honor for the rest of my life. Culture and more. This system is so ingrained and in so many facets of society. We're talking about the criminal legal system, but it goes far beyond that because this is something that's just really in the consciousness of everyone. And once a month, we'll be shaking it up and lightening it up with some true crime trivia. Dialogue. That's dialogue with a D-I-E is available on all podcast listening platforms. Okay, so the Trabuco Treasure. Um, we have some native flute playing <laughs> going on? Question mark? Pan, pan flute? <laughs> yeah, something. And Stack describing the American Southwest as immense, desolate, and nearly uninhabitable. But Eliza was just there, so I don't think I so, Mr. Stack. To, I lived She to lived see to the tell day. the tale. <laughs> Quote, vast horizons where one can be alone and observe, where secrets can be hidden amongst the sand, sage, and chaparral. Wow. In 1933, just north, north of Farmington, New Mexico, in the summer, a daredevil pilot named Red Mo- Moisure made several mysterious flights into the desert where he was met by a Mexican millionaire named Leon Trabuco. And the reenactment shows Trabuco in that full white suit with white fedora Um. and white cane. And he is stoking a fire in the desert as a plane descends, and it's just, like, kind of an amazing sight. (laughs) Love it. Um, Stack says, 19 years later, the secrets of the enigmatic and elusive Trabuco would begin to unravel. In 1952, a federal grand jury was brought together after investigations by the United States Treasury and the Secret Service. It's alleged that Leon Trabuco and four other financiers had a plot to buy up much of Mexico's gold reserves and sell it in the U.S. Um, And as an aside, um, (laughs) on Amazon Prime, the film rise segments are all named. Mm -hmm. And this one was called Mucho Oro. (laughs) Which just means a lot of gold. (laughs) So Stack says the scheme was conceived at the height of the Great Depression and born from a conspiracy of greed. By spring of 1933, Trabuco and his associates were convinced that the U.S. would soon devalue the dollar, which would make gold prices skyrocket. But the operation was risky. Their gold would have to be smuggled into the U.S., and if caught, the conspirators would face long prison terms. So they had a makeshift foundry in Puebla, Mexico, where the gold was melted down and cast into ingots. And I definitely had to look up what's an ingot. And it's just blocks or bars of metal. So the most obvious form of gold. (laughs) I guess, yeah. Bars. Gold bars. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) In less than three months, they had amassed 16 tons of solid gold. Oh, my God. Which, to put in perspective for myself, I had to put in increments of elephant. Elephant! I <laughs> knew you were going to say that! <laughs> because that's what I think of when I think of a ton of anything. I'm like, aren't elephants a couple of those? So, 
Of course, there are different types of elephants. <laughs> oh, boy, oh, here, here we, we go. go. <laughs> but they are between two and seven tons. Oh, damn. So they had roughly two to four elephants worth of gold, if my elephant math is correct. <laughs> <laughs> Love Nothing's it. ever made more sense to me. Cute. Right? I know. So Trabuco had to find a secret place in the U.S. to hide the gold. <laughs> A secret giant place. Um, But he made several trips to look at buildings, and he couldn't find the right place. So he decided to bury that burying the gold would make more sense. Stack says that, quote, legend has it, he found a rural area in the northwest corner of New Mexico near the Ute and Navajo reservations, just north of the small town of Farmington. Red Moisure allegedly made 16 flights, carrying about one ton per trip. Wow. Which... Is a very small plane, and I'm very concerned about Same. a ton of gold being on it. That's exactly <laughs> what I thought. Are you concerned for their very wealthy safety? Yeah. <laughs> they find. Their very wealthy <laughs> criminal safety. Yeah. Every delivery would be picked up by a pickup truck and taken to the secret location. Stack says, oddly, Leon, Leon Trabuco never made a map of the location, nor did he reveal the burial place to his co-conspirators. Uh, but I'm like... <laughs> Would you reveal your secret gold stash to everyone you know, Mr. Stack? No. Nope. First rule of buried treasure is you don't talk about buried treasure. <laughs> so records show the final shipment was delivered July 14th, 1933. And six and a half months later, the Gold Reserve Act of 1943 became law. So that essentially meant you could not, you just couldn't own gold. You couldn't have fucking gold That's bars so so weird. in your possession. Is that still a thing? No. Um, I think I read something about it wasn't, but it was like a long time until it wasn't. Huh, weird. So the price of gold then skyrocketed and the conspirators made a cool seven milli overnight. Ooh. But these gold schemers were feeling themselves, honey. <laughs> they were sure that the price would continue to rise and they'd no. be just Scrooge McDucking it over there. No. Greedy Greederson. No. Get out with it. (laughs) But Stack says, blinded by greed, they were unaware of an executive order related to the Gold Act. It stated that private ownership of gold within the U.S. borders after the date of January 17th, 1934 would be punishable by imprisonment. Mm. So that means, too, then they're not going to be able to sell it no or they've already sold everything you already can't sell it that's not allowed like if you okay. you have to give it to the government <laughs> no isn't that the definition of communism mm. you have to give all your stuff to the government mm. <laughs> uh, truly. okay no i'm i'm confused i truly am. yeah i'm just genuinely confusing. wondering what's happening <laughs> So it's been a while, honeys, but yes, we do have an interview with a treasure hunter. Oh, yes. boy. What does he look like? Gosh, I can't imagine. Oh. What demographic is this man? Ed Foster is his name, and he is checking all the treasure hunter boxes, honey. <laughs> he is old. He is white. He is male. He has delusions of grandeur, and he has too much time on his hands. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. All of the requirements. Oh, man. Ed Foster says, when FDR put the, put the gold embargo, that takes gold off the market. Stack then tells us that Ed grew up in Farmington, New Mexico, and has spent over 35 years researching Trabuco's treasure. Uh, boy, oh boy. But I do kind of like Ed Foster. Um, he tells it like it is, and he says that what embargo meant was that it was illegal to sell gold. He says, and so consequently, these five men, financiers from Mexico City, they had 20 tons of junk. <laughs> yeah. It was not worth a dime because they couldn't sell it for anything. It's true. Stack tells us that within five years, three of the conspirators met with untimely deaths. Mm-mm. So... Leon Trabuco hit the road with his gold and spent 20 years traveling, quote, in a vain attempt to sell the illegal treasure. Hmm. So, sorry, so when you said they made $7 million, they didn't actually have that. That's just what their gold was worth had they been able to sell it. Yes. So they didn't yeah. have the, oh, nope, boy. they just have okay. a bunch of useless metal. That sucks. It's just a bunch of junk, <laughs> mm-hmm. if you ask Ed. In 1952, Trabuco tried to make a deal with U.S. government officials prompting the grand jury investigation mentioned at the top of the segment. Mm. 
But Trabuco was never indicted. And as in every treasure segment, Hanis, he just died a few years later, taking the secret location of the gold to his grave. <sighs> um, but obviously this is where Ed Foster takes over with his treasure hunting. So Stack tells us that he is convinced he's found the landing strip that Red Moisher used in 1933. Okay. It's a seven-mile-long plateau called Conger Mesa. Ed Foster then ensures we know he's an old white guy by saying, I met this Indian lady that couldn't speak English. Oh. So I got an interpreter. Oh, no. Ed says she told him she'd seen the plane land there many times. Ed says he spoke to another Navajo woman who was six years old in 1933. She said that she remembered several Mexican men who lived on the reservation. Ed Foster tells us that would be very unusual for Mexican men to move there and for a Spanish or white man to move there would be unheard of. 20 miles west of Conger Mesa near an abandoned Navajo home is a building completely different from any other on the reservation. So they show this on UM and the difference yeah. of the Navajo home is so the Navajo homes are kind of this small stone dome. Mm -hmm. But this building, it was made of stone, but it was square shaped um, and it was more of a Mexican style home. Okay. So Foster goes on to tell us why it's different. It had windows, a front and back door and a veranda. <laughs> It is interesting. They, they were mm -hmm. very different. Hmm. Yes. But then it's also, well, keep going. But why would they build something that's going to stick out like that then? Yeah. Well, <sighs> unless I just didn't know any no, better. No, yeah. He says that a house like this would, quote, look good in Tijuana, but not on the Navajo reservation. Hmm. Foster thinks this building was constructed by the men that Trabuco had guarding the gold. 28 miles east of the home, Ed found a, quote, clue regarding the treasure etched in the stone outcropping he calls Shrine Rock. So they take us there on UM, and Ed shows us the carving <laughs> into the rock face, and it says, 1933, 16, T-O-N. So Ed believes that there's a treasure triangle. <laughs> it's a, quote, clue, baby. Mm-hmm. He thinks the treasure is buried somewhere in the triangle that's created by Conger Mesa, the Mexican-style home, and Shrine Rock. So, um, don't worry, guys. Ed calls in the treasure big guns, quote, internationally renowned treasure hunter Norm Scott, to help conduct a survey of the area. Norm Scott, who is shockingly also an old white guy. Oh, my God. Says, what? I know. It's just, I can't even believe. Says he's been in the treasure biz 30 years and 80, 80 to 90% of the treasure he looks into can be chalked up to a fictional writer. But in his highly regarded treasure opinion, this treasure has a ring of authenticity to it, and therefore it deserves attention. I mean, I have to say, I feel like our treasure hunter Diz does know his history, New Mexico history. Mm -hmm. And yes. he probably found some records of Trabuco trying to do a deal with the government, which that tells you he did have the gold at some point. I don't of. doubt that Trabuco or this whole scenario is yeah. is not real because there's pictures of him and his posse, mm -hmm. which are cool. Right. Pictures. Oh, yeah. Those are cool. Well, and but a lot of them are just based off, like, t at literally legend. Mm -hmm. And this one yes. seems, yeah, like there's a paper, somewhat of a paper trail. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah, totally. Ed Foster says, I have looked with my eyes and metal detectors for many years. <laughs> His other eyes. And now they have tech. <laughs> First with the eyes. Then you try the metal detector if that doesn't work. And now they have technology. And that's why I think it's going to be found with technology. <laughs> Enter reenactment of Norm Scott and his treasure team setting up treasure technology. <laughs> and for some reason, they all need to wear matching jumpsuits like they're the fucking uh, Ghostbusters. Yes. <laughs> uh, treasure jumpsuits. They were bright blue, but still, I was like, guys, is this necessary? <laughs> Quote, it's not going to be found with dumb luck, Ed says with a little smile, because I've spent all of that. <laughs> He's self-aware, at least. Mm -hmm. He is. <sighs> and you know what? He didn't turn out to be as bad as I thought he was going to be, other than not knowing to not say the word Indian. He right. also wasn't racist, so. Yeah. Although, okay. <laughs> I have to say, I work with an indigenous woman, and she says it's okay to say Indian. I still don't feel I think it's okay for her to for say it. For some reason. She says, I can say it too, and I'm, but I feel weird about it. 
I have noticed there's still a lot of organizations Mm -hmm. that have been around a while that still use that term, too. So I still, yeah. Anyway. I don't know. So (laughs) I could not find anything on this. No, really? Mm. Normally, uh, I mean, I found it talked about on several of, like, those treasure networks and stuff like Mm. that, but it was always the exact info from UM. Like, even the quotes pulled were from UM. Wow. Normally, you can at least find yeah. another treasure hunter that's talking yeah. about it or something. Yeah. But I could not find anything. Sad. Which is so weird because I feel like of all of the treasure segments we've had so far, this seems the most realistic. It did. It happened fairly recently. Yeah. Photographs of this person with this group of other people. There's mm-hmm. anecdotal evidence of him buying this gold up and buying this gold. So... Of all of the treasure segments we've yeah. had, it's it's surprising. Yeah, it's surprising that I there's know. no more information about it. I know. And, like, as you get farther and farther back in, like, the Googs, mm-hmm. it just starts talking about other treasures in New Mexico. Yeah. And I was reminded of how many there are. Oh, there's so many. <laughs> it's so weird. But, yeah, wow. I couldn't find. I couldn't find. How funny. Ugh. Yeah. Mm. I would have thought that there would have been a lot of, well, not a lot, but something, because it's it's so recent. It's not the mm-hmm. 1800s. It's, you know, during FDR. Well, yeah. sounds like we got to go. I gotta, guess I got to go back to New Mexico. Yeah. Okay. Sounds go like on. Eliza needs to look with her eyes and the and eyes of my her metal, metal detectors. detectors. <laughs> yes. Preferably both methods. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, you did it. You, you did it. I, yep, I did. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So things to share and feel, friends. Allison? Uh, yeah, I got a show. Do it. I always got a show. Well, we spoke about this, I think, briefly on another episode, but I'm not sure if it was an official sharesy feelsy. So I'm officially sharing it and feeling it. Uh, it's the show Hacks on HBO, starring Jean Smart, who is a queen and is queen. finally getting her recompense. She's an amazing actress. She's been around forever. And she plays a famous female comedian who has a long run um, on Vegas. And the owner of the casino that she works for is trying to replace her. So she is trying to come up with some new jokes. And she hires a young writer um, who I do not know who she is. Uh, My partner said that she was on a couple episodes of The Daily Show. um, She's a a famous person's daughter. Yeah. Her mom was on SNL. Oh. I'm trying to remember who her mom is. Uh, Lorraine Newman. Oh, oh, Lorraine Newman. Oh, so she was the first season of SNL. Lorraine Newman. Yeah. She's really she's really good in the show. And I also love Paul W. Downs and the girl that plays the secretary. Who's Paul W. Downs? So he's actually a writer and producer on the show, I believe. But he, oh. I know him from um, Broad City. Oh, okay. I oh, my gosh. Say. He's the manager. He's yeah. her manager, Hannah's manager. Yeah. Oh. I mean, her name's not Hannah, whatever her name yeah, is. Yeah, he's show. really funny. Okay. But yeah. then the girl that plays the... And the girl that plays the secretary, who's the <sighs> daughter of the owner of the company, yes. is amazing. Everybody in it is so good, and it's such a quirky cast of people that I didn't know besides Jean Smart. Mm-hmm. But it's just great. It's really, really great. Um, yeah. It's so great. I highly recommend it. I agree with that, Recco. Um, well, hmm. I mean, <laughs> we did just uh, have the finale of RuPaul's Drag Race All-Stars Season 6. Oh, I saw a little congratulation post from my friend. Yes, that watches I was it. holding off because I wanted to give people a couple days and not have any spoiler alerts. So that was fun. We have our first ever trans woman as the winner of the season, Love which it. is great. Oh, that's so, awesome. Yeah. It was a really good season. It was fun. Nice. Love it. Um, well, we talk. Uh, one of us has to rep- recommend a Wondery podcast every show. That's just. Uh-huh. We must. It's the law. What we do. And I'm going to recommend Suspects. Ooh. Mm. It's um, very well done about a murder that takes place outside of Seattle and a man who's. A black man who's maybe not the person that did it. 
But the person charged, all about this woman who's murdered after a Halloween party. And it's, it's really interesting because the police talk about how they had all these photos from the night, mm -hmm. but they just have the people in their costumes. Like, everyone had to wear a costume. It was this big apartment Halloween party. Mm -hmm. And so they would find look at people and say, okay, we need to talk to the guy dressed as a construction worker. We need to talk yeah. to the guy in this devil mask. Like, it's wow. just crazy mm -hmm. but and then it really talks about dna evidence and how easy it would be to have your dna on something when you had nothing to do with the actual crime it's really really scary mm -hmm. so i highly recommend suspect nice cool and then what are we covering next episode 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 right. 12 so i am covering a wanted segment about michael st Clair and dennis reese and they are monsters and oh, we're going to learn all about them. Oh, no. They are violent, insane criminals. Oh, they're awful. God. They're not insane. They're totally sane and very violent. Which oh, is why no. they're monsters. Exactly. Um, and then we have an unexplained death segment about Dan Tonderwald. And a lost loves about Jim Curie. And we'll see you next week for that. Uh, don't forget, if you like this show, it really helps us if you leave a review and a rating, a five-star rating. We have a review to read from Canada. We know it's from Canada because they spell favorite with an O-U, honey. <laughs> <laughs> they say, my new favorite podcast. My only disappointment is that I have now caught up and will have to wait for new episodes. Allison, Eliza, and Carlin bring their great personalities and superior research skills to every episode. I love rewatching these old episodes of Unsolved Mysteries and then listening to their update on every story. I even rewatch and listen to the mysterious legends and ghost segments because I know they will somehow make them interesting. <laughs> we try. And that was from Canadian Tree Frog. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, little froggy. I never thought we'd have a tree frog listening to us. <laughs> I hope you're not endangered. So that's one way to support the show, and we might even read your review on an episode. Another way to support the show is go to patreon.com slash Resolve Mysteries Podcast and subscribe at the $5 a month level or higher. You'll get ad-free episodes, two extra episodes a month, and other goodies. To see photos we reference in the episode, follow us on Instagram at Resolve Mysteries Podcast and on Facebook and Twitter at Resolve the Pod. You can contact us at resolvemysteriespodcast.com, resolvemysteriespodcast.gmail.com, or at our P.O. Box 14005, Portland, Oregon, 97293. Send us to some of those places your stories for listener short stack episodes so that we can read them and keep making those. You can send us anything you'd like to, and we'll most likely read it. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Like I said, leave a five-star review. For every review we receive, we're donating a dollar to the Coalition of Immokali Workers. And, oh my gosh, we love you. Oh we love you so. Oh my gosh. What a coincidence. I also love them. Oh, we have so much in common, you guys. No, Let's make a podcast together. Oh, no, let's not. It's so much no, work. No, it's too much work. <laughs> okay, bye. Bye. bye, -bye. He found a rural area in the northwest corner of New Mexico near. What was that? What's that? You moving stuff? I'm not. Oh, no. Hmm. Weird. Uh, what's that sound? <laughs> I don't know. I don't hear anything. Oh. You and really? I hear it? Something's scraping. Weird. All right.